But you can just, uh, just right where you're at, let's just take a moment. Holy Spirit, you are welcome. You're welcome to breathe your very breath, your wind, directly into our hearts, our inward man. We ask for that even now, Holy Spirit. You are the breath of life. We would ask for your sensitivity that we would not move against you but with you. That you would be able, each one of our hearts tonight, to accomplish all that you desire to in this moment. Go beyond. Holy Spirit, the limitation of myself as a vessel and each one of us. Do the impossible within us. You are the Lord of the impossible. Unearth, unearth in us our own strength and its limitations, but also to see the unlimitedness. the full possibilities of your fullness. We ask for tenderness. We would ask to be awakened by your kiss and or your shaking, whatever is required. We just align our hearts to you tonight. Where I need to be shaken, shake me. Where your kiss will suffice, then amen, so be it. But overall, we say amen, so be it. In this moment, Holy Spirit, every other agenda we set aside to be with you in this moment in a unique way, in a transforming way, in a conformity to the very image of the eternal Lamb of God. For this to be a part of that great process, the journey of the bride. To become one with you. We ask, Holy Spirit, that you would grant us a clarity to our the eyes of our spirit, the eyes of our heart, that our ears, spiritually speaking, would be enabled by you, Holy Spirit, to hear what's inaudible in the natural. So we bless you tonight. I want us to look at a few, again, a few fragments of Scripture. We're going to begin in Ephesians chapter 1.
Ephesians chapter 1. We're going to just read a, a, a small portion of this, beginning with uh, verse number 5. <clears throat> he predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself according to the kind intention of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, which he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight. He made known to us the mystery or the secret of his will according to his kind intention which he purposed in him with a view to an administration suitable to the fullness of the times, that is, the summing up of all things in Christ, things in the heavens, Things upon the earth. Then I want us to uh, turn over to Colossians chapter 1. I want to get to Paul's prayer in here. Colossians chapter 1, verse number 9. For this reason also, since the day we heard of it, their faith, we have not ceased to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. There's a reason that Paul's praying this. Here is the reason. So that you may walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, to please him in all respects, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Strengthened with all power, according to his glorious might, for the attaining of all steadfastness and patience, joyously giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints in light." I want to have time to go through every portion of these passages. I, I want us to see both in Ephesians 1 and Colossians 1 uh, the commonality of these two uh, books, number one, which Paul wrote. But verse 9 of Colossians 1 is focused specifically upon us being filled with the knowledge of his will. Now, this is the eternal purpose or the eternal will of God that Paul is praying for the church. It's not not that this is unimportant. This is sec- of secondary importance. It's not that Paul is asking that the will of God be given to each of us as to what we're to be doing at this moment, what job we're to have or whatever. That's not his focus. Again, not that that's not important, not that we don't need God's guidance. We do. Not that we don't want his direction or should want his direction. We should. But that's not what he's praying for. Both in Ephesians 1 and Colossians 1, it ties in with Ephesians 3, which we'll go back to here in a moment. Paul's actually praying for the church to be filled with the knowledge of his will. Again, it demands that, and he explains this, in all spiritual wisdom and understanding so that we may walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. So, same idea here in Ephesians chapter 1, as he says that, verse 9, he made known to us the mystery of his will. So that's the eternal purpose being uh, brought into view. Again, uh, the rest of the verse shows that according to his kind intention, which he purposed. So it is the eternal purpose or the eternal will of God that Paul is praying that the church, the people of God, be filled with that understanding, that knowledge. 
Again, uh, I don't need to point this out, but let me point this out. They are believers needing to be filled with the knowledge of the eternal will of God. That is the Apostles' Prayer. As we know, uh, the knowledge of God is not a one-time event in our lives. Isn't that right? It is. I call this the journey of the bride, by the way. That's my language for it. The bride has a journey that she must go on. And she's conformed to the image of the Lamb in her journey. She's transformed. By beholding the Lord into that very image. The Greek word for image, I'm not going to turn to all these passages. We would be just going from passage to passage. But image uh, assumes something. The Greek word image assumes something. It, 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 assume, it assumes a prototype. And in that language, the prototype was the parents. This is one of the examples. The parents producing a child in their image. So... To be conformed to the image of Christ, to be conformed to the image of the Lamb, of course, then the prototype is Christ. The prototype, if we're dealing with the bridal paradigm, is the Lamb. The bride is the wife of the Lamb. And that's an important distinction. Jesus Christ is the eternal Lamb of God. But that name, Jesus, means Savior. Christ is the anointed one. Anointed one there is speaking of a, of, a, of a missional purpose of God. Anointing actually speaks of that. It implies a mission, an intention to that anointing of God. Many times we, we are, and rightly so, we recognize upon us an anointing What we must understand with that anointing is the mission of God or the purpose of God in that anointing. Now, Christ, the anointed one, is living in us. Hey, Demetrius and Sherry, just want to say hey. I could say hey to a bunch out here, but uh, Christ, the anointed one, is living in us. And all authority in heaven and earth has been given unto him. However... That's, though that be a fact, there is still the flow of us, better, better said, there is still the demand for the release of him in and through us. And in fact, I'll say it this way, we, it's not just the salvific Jesus, which is a seed in us, that is God's fullness. Christ in us in salvation is a seed. That demands an increase of him, and guess what? A decrease of us. And that's divine order. Not me decreasing so that he'll increase. That's not divine order. Divine order is he must increase. I must decrease. So the way to uh, get muddy water out of a glass is by pouring pure water in the glass, and the pure water will drive the muddy water out of the glass. That's God's operational mode. I'm going to get sidetracked if I'm not careful. (laughs) By the way, God is a farmer. That's what Jesus said about his father. And he plants a seed in the earth that is us. That seed is Christ. It's Jesus, but it's not Jesus in his fullness. I mean this. That the fullness of his release, the fullness of his glory, is not complete in the vessel. And by the way, I'm not just speaking individually. I'm really speaking both individually and corporately. The demand is growth. The demand is progression. Otherwise, listen, when we were saved, the Lord would take us. I just want you to ponder that point for a moment. If the only reason we're here is to be saved and no other purpose, the Lord would just take us. We are here to become, not just be saved. The bride has a journey of being conformed to the image, of being transformed 
even by the renewing of her mind, so that that eternal will, Romans 12, so that the eternal will of God can be realized in us. That's not at the beginning of our salvation. It's through the progression, the journey of the bride. Anyway, so Paul's prayer for the church, for the believers, we know that. He's writing these books to the church, to the believers, and he's pressing them as the Spirit of God is pressing us again in this time. I thank God for his pressing. I don't want to miss this hour of visitation that is upon us where the Holy Spirit is pressing us into deeper waters. I hope you can feel that in the Spirit. He's pressing us. He's pressing us. His objective is to give himself more fully to us, to increase among us in the power of his life and his presence. Fullness is God's objective, not seed. Fullness. To come to the measure of the stature of the fullness which belongs to Christ. That's Ephesians 4. That's the purpose of the ministries being given to the church. By the way, that's the purpose of the Holy Spirit being given to us. To move us off the ground of the immature, the child, through a progression. We talked a little bit about this last night. To maturity. I'm not, and here's what I'm not saying. I want to be clear. I'm not talking about perfectionism. I am talking about the goal of God, though. <clears throat> so some uh, get tripped up by this. And uh, no, I'm not speaking about perfection. I am speaking about God's aim and about God's goal in this. So now let us look a little bit at Philippians here, chapter 3. And then we'll come back to Ephesians, chapter 3. And we'll look at a few other scriptures Philippians chapter 3, let's begin with verse number 7. But whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. More than that, I count all things to be loss in view of the surpassing value of of knowing, that's an intimacy word, knowing there is. It's not head knowledge, it's experiential knowledge of the Lord. The view of the surpassing value, notice his language. There's nothing more valuable than this intimacy with the Lord. That's a bridal paradigm when you see it. That's what Paul's describing. The surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and I count them but rubbish. Those all things that he's referencing directly here in chapter 3 is his being a Jew. He had, listen, Paul had to suffer the loss of his Jewish inheritance in order to come into Christ. No different with the Gentiles. What we're really suffering the loss of, though, is our Adamic nature. Isn't that true? Jew and Gentile are outside of Christ needing Jesus. The whole world needs Jesus. Amen. I don't want to belabor that. I get accused of saying a lot of things. (laughs) Folks, some of my best friends are Jewish, and they know the Lord. And I've had them to say to me, what's this, what's this thing with you Gentiles about basically worshiping us Jews who need the Lord? I said, it's deception. That's what it is. <laughs> That's way too plain for some people, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. No, no, listen. The whole world is bound up. The, the Lord promised the Jews Jesus, and they don't have another promise. They don't need another promise. Just thought we might want to know that. He promised the Gentiles Jesus. Same promise. Amen. Just thought we were to know that. I hear all this stuff about this sometimes, and it's like, you know, there's something better than the Lord that God has promised us. There is nothing better than Him. 
But anyway, I'm digressing. Trying to be clear, though, with us. Listen, it doesn't get any better than knowing the Lord and progressing in Him. There's nothing better. There's not a third thing out here that's coming. Everything that we have needed has been offered and given to us in the fullness of God, but needing to be realized God is in His fullness we're not. We need the progression. We need His increase, don't we? we? There demands growth in this. There's a huge distinction between what God is offering us in His fullness and where we are in smallness. Isn't that true? It's always true. All right, so Paul is referencing directly his former life in Judaism. He says of that former life... He suffered the loss of all of it to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ. Amen. Can't be said any better than that by you. Amen. I know this is going down like a rat sandwich. (laughs) I can feel it. Because I'm touching golden idols. In fact, I aim to smash them. Listen, folks, we need Jesus. The world needs Jesus. Isn't that true? There is no other name under heaven whereby men can be saved. There is no other name. There's not a way for the Jews to God and a way for the Gentiles to God. There's Jesus. One way, one name, one avenue, one purpose. Can we just crush the deception that's going through the church once and for all here? So anyway, that's not you guys, but I'm, I know when I say this, you guys know it goes all over the internet, and then I'll, anyway, so, all right. So Paul's heart for God could not be attained in Judaism. He couldn't be satisfied there. Neither can we in any other religion, not even in the Christian religion. Christianity has become a religion. We know that. That's no surprise. It's not Christ that we're, we're offended by these days. It's the religion of Christianity. And the Lord years ago told me you need to begin to make a distinction between the religion of Christianity and what it means to be in relationship with Christ. Y'all with me in that? It's just true. So many are offended at Christianity in our nation presently because they've never known Christ and experienced the fullness of Him. Isn't that true? So, so let me go on. Verse 9. Here's Paul's prayer. He, he said he counted all the other stuff as rubbish in order that he might gain Christ and might be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law. See, the law never got Paul to where the law was meant to get people. Paul never allowed the law to tutor him and get him to Christ. So all the law ever was was a tutor to get us to Christ. And once you break through, even David did, in the Old Testament and got to Christ, you didn't need the law. Enoch didn't need the law. Abraham didn't need the law. Melchizedek didn't need the law. Job didn't need the law, did they? Seth didn't need the law. The law became mandatory because people wouldn't put their faith in the Lamb, of whom the sacrifices spoke. But there were some who did. Can you say amen to that? There have always been a bloodline of men and women of God who went after the Lord Himself. The Scriptures are clear, clear concerning this testimony. And of them, God speaks words like in Ezekiel fourteen fourteen in verse 20. If even these three, Noah... Daniel and Job were to stand before me. He says that twice in chapter 14 of Ezekiel. My heart still would not change concerning these people. Jeremiah chapter 15, verse number 1. If even Moses and Samuel were to stand before me, my heart would not change concerning these people. Talking about Israel. God makes a distinction. Gabriel comes and speaks to Daniel and says, You're highly esteemed. And he says it three times to him. What's God doing there? There's a distinction. Not this. I want to be clear about this. God's not showing favoritism. 
God is responding to those who have accepted his invitation, which is to everyone, the whole of humanity, but it must be entered into wholeheartedly. God has forever responded to people who are wholehearted with him in a bridegroom bride demeanor. It's true. It's true everywhere in the scriptures once you see it. Matthew 25, there's, they're all virgins, but five of them are ready. For what? For a wedding feast, and five aren't. And only the ones who have made themselves ready, Revelation 19, come into the marriage, supper of the Lamb. Matthew chapter 22, the kingdom of God is prepared to a wedding feast. Powerful, isn't it? See what's going on here? So I want to get to this. I want want us to press on here for a second. I want us to see this in this passage of Scripture as we progress. Verse 10, that I may know him. Here's that bridal paradigm. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his sufferings, and being, what is it, conformed. Conformed. You know, that's not an option. Conformity is not an option. It is a demand. Transformation is not an option. It is a requirement. Just, this is a side note. I'm going to get in trouble for saying this, but I've said it before and it bears repeating. Listen, not here. I'm just talking about it. It goes on the Internet. A lot of people traveling our nation and the nations, leading repentance movements. But repentance without transformation is futile. If repentance, genuine repentance is this way, will lead to, and I call it this, it is transformational repentance, genuine repentance, a turning to God, thus turning away from our self-centered living. And listen, that's not only for the nations that know, don't know the Lord, the peoples in the nations that don't know the Lord. God is, listen, the Lord is sending His people to his people. That's not unusual. It's throughout the scriptures. Do you know, I heard this years ago. China has raised up 100,000 missionaries to send to this nation. Anyway, I'm, I'm getting to something here. So... Verse 11, in order that I may attain, see, verse 10 and 11, I want to know him in the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death in order, underline this, that I may attain. That's not works-based. It's dedication-based. I want us to hear that clearly. It's not working something that will satisfy the Lord. It's a bridegroom-bride relationship. What satisfies the bridegroom is his bride's dedication. His ultimate dedication demands her ultimate dedication. You with me on that? God's ultimate dedication must be matched and will be matched by his bride. She dedicates him herself back unto him. That's what Paul's really talking about in this passage. We have the Old Testament passages of that, but perhaps there's no clearer New Testament passage than Philippians chapter 3. There's several. I could talk about 2 Corinthians chapter 11. I fear for you. I betrothed you to one husband. There it is again. But I fear for you. Lest as the serpent deceived Eve, who is Eve? The bride. Who did the serpent attack? The bride. Who's he attacking now? The bride. What's his intention? Paul nails it, 2 Corinthians 11. You be led astray from the simplicity and purity of devotion to Christ. Revelation chapter 2, John's writing what the Lord says to Ephesus. You have left, not lost, you have left your first love. 
If it was only lost, it was left. Left implies this. You have forsaken me for another. The bride is only the bride because she is conformed to the image. It's not her invitation alone. It is conformity to the image. I'm going to hit that hard. We've got way too much sovereignty going on in the church. We've got things arising called universalism right in the church, right in the prophetic movement. I'm well aware of it. They're calling me and others of us terrorists in the body of Christ because we're speaking like what we're speaking. I warn you in the Lord, there's the need for repentance in the body of Christ, and a showdown is coming. I warn you. I warn you that this half-hearted living rather than wholeheartedness towards the Lord is the root cause for the mess we're in as a nation. I don't, have to, I don't like, enjoy talking this way, but we've crossed a line. The Lord's alerted me to this, and it's going to demand something of us in this time. I plead with you to hear my heart. I know these things offend us. I'm aware of that. They offended me. Much of what I'm talking about I did not believe four months ago. It's by revelation. You won't get there but just reading the Scriptures without the help of the Holy Spirit getting us there. I plead with you to be able to hear my words, but ask the Holy Spirit about it. The only hope for our nation lies in the move that God wants to do among His people, and it begins with a baptism of repentance. Amen. That's why the collision's coming, because a whole segment of the church now, I can name where it's coming out of, or several places of it, is preaching there's no need for repentance. Thus the showdown is brewing. You can't have God, the Spirit, moving to bring His church to repentance in a whole segment of church of the church saying there's no need for repentance. Guess what, folks? The showdown's coming. It's going to be ugly, not pretty. But listen, the Lord's going to have a people. It's going to be in Ephesians chapter 5 people. They will be without spot or wrinkle. They will not be shamed. Isn't that true? The bride is without spot, without wrinkle. There's no shame around her. Amen. This is going down like a rat sandwich. I can tell that, but that's okay. <clears throat> we need the Lord. I need the Lord. You need the Lord to help us to understand the time we're living in and the battle that is in front of us and what God would restore of His testimony, of His name and the people of His name, of His glory and of His eternal purpose in our generation. Things have been lost here. God's not okay with it. I'm not okay. Are you Okay. I'm not okay. The burden of the Lord is in this thing, and all true ministry begins with that burden, and travail is the ultimate outspray of that burden. It is incredibly necessary. I've been commanded of the Lord this year to take the seed of travail to the congregations. Let me tell you what he said. You may not want to hear it, so put your fingers in your ears. You don't want to hear this. Here's what he said. For those, Terry, who will receive the seed of travail, I will release, but as a farmer... Travail among them. But for those congregations who will not receive the seed of travail, I will bring division among them. Strong word, isn't it? This is not an option I'm presenting to you. It's hope. So I'm being required to say some things. And uh, I don't have time, but other messages I go through, I'll go into it a little bit tonight. Why it's true. There's sound biblical reason for why I'm saying what I'm saying. Much of what I can't get to. But we understand this. Now speak right to your spirit for a second. Bypass your mind. It's necessary. Go right to your spirit. You know the truth of what I'm telling you. We're in trouble as a nation. And the solution is not by continuing to do the same stupid things we've been doing. It's mindless to think those things are going to change or transform anything. The greatest temptation we're going to face in this time because of the power of the presence of God that He aims to come among us with is to continue to do what we know to do. 
The Lord, listen, the Lord is coming among us and disrupting us to stop us from doing what we've been doing. To just say, I don't know what to do, so we're just going to do what we're do-. Listen, to do what you know to do when the Lord's disrupting is never the right thing. Ever. Otherwise, He wouldn't be disrupting us. If doing what we're doing is what's needed, why would He disrupt us? Just want to, that's not, I'm not trying to just be logical in this. I'm trying to say something to our hearts. The question that will come to you, am I pliable enough before the Lord? Am I pliable enough to be challenged? Can I humble myself before the Lord? Humility is not an option, it's a requirement. Can I humble, can I release my pride of what I think I know about God? Humble myself. God will give grace to the humble, but He's going to resist the proud proud in this. This is intense, isn't it? I know. Take a deep breath. It's about to get worse. <laughs> Listen, we're required to say some difficult things. I've got to say them. You're either going to have the fear of man in this or the fear of God. I choose the fear of God. Say, so, man, I tell you, you're not going to be invited back. I don't care. I'm tired from traveling anyway. Make my day. I really, I'm serious. I don't do this for money. I'm not here to serve you. I'm here to serve the Lord than you. I want to make that very clear. I don't care about your giving. I don't. I'm not here for the money in the thing. I'm not kidding. There's a trap in this thing. It's called becoming a hireling. I am not that, nor will I ever be that. I will not be driven by the need for money. God knows our needs. Anyway, and I'm speaking to the choir here. But by the way, I just want to say something to us. We're either going to fear God in this time or be drawn or stay in the fear of man. How many want to, you don't have to raise your hand. How many with me want to say, look, I want the fear of God that crushes the fear of man in my life. We are called upon in this time. For such a time as this, you've been brought to the kingdom. And it's going to require the saying of some things you don't want to say. We're going to be prophetic. It's going to require us to say some things that challenge. God is challenging us. He's challenging me. I hope you can feel that in the room. (laughs) Take a deep breath. Just pretend like Terry didn't mean it. (laughs) Though I do. The Lord's made very plain to me some things. You've got to know something about me. The Lord's told me directly by encounter, if you are silent now, your purpose for existence is over. I am not playing games. This is not a game. This is a call to repentance. That's heavy. I know it's heavy. But you invited me. You may never invite me again. I don't care. I just want to be clear with you. I love you, but not that much. <laughs> not before the Lord, I don't. Not more than Him. I don't. Nor should I, nor should you love me that much. You ask the Lord about what I'm telling you. He'll tell you. Something's got a hold of people in this day, myself included, and I could name many others. Rick Joyner. God's got a hold of the man. I know. I'm in communication with him. He didn't believe in the bride either until Elijah showed up to him a few weeks ago and rebuked him. That's the truth, folks. I know that firsthand. This ain't a game. Dedication is not an option in this. It's a demand. I could go down the list with many others. That I regularly communicate. It's not I'm trying, trying to pull names. I'm trying to say something to our hearts. Hear my heart in this. God aims to awaken us, and I need it, and you need it. Isn't that true? I need it. I want it. Do you want it? I am not going to be checked out in this move that the Lord is now actually initiating. It's greater than just a movement. 
I'm not going to be standing on the outside uninvolved. I want to be directly involved in the will of God with His body. My heart is the Lord's in this. For the sake of the Lord and His body. That was the, that was the uh, decree, the, the commitment I made. Jamie was talking about it the other day. Listen, when I turned 50, the Lord encountered me and said, "For you repeat after me. This was the commitment. For the sake of the Lamb. I said it, for the sake of the Lamb. He wouldn't tell me anything else until I repeated that back to Him. He didn't ask me. He told me. For the sake of the Lamb. For the sake of the Lamb. For the sake of His body, His bride, His people. I said it. I say yes. To live as Christ and to die as gain. Somewhere down the line, Gene, a line's drawn in the sand in our hearts in this. And if we say yes to go on with the Lord, that will unleash the revelation of the person in a way we've never known him, never seen. I can tell you this for a fact. The fear and the terror of the Lord is bound up with it. We're either going to be a flexible wineskin in this or one that is destroyed. I don't think I need to be any more clear than that, do I? So, Paul, let's get to this. In order that I might attain, I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I've already obtained it or have already become perfect. That's mature. It's goal-oriented. But I press on. There it is. I press on in order that I may lay hold of that for which also I was laid hold of. He's not talking about salvation. The man's been saved for years. He's talking about a deeper commitment, a deeper consecration, an eternal purpose in God that demands something of us. The church is not keen on the demands in this hour. It's an entitlement mentality. We think the fact that we have Jesus in us is all there is to it. I'm telling you, the fact that you have Jesus in you is simply the beginning point of coming back into the original intention of God that demands something of us. Work out your, your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who is at work in you, both to do and to will. There is a progression. Salvation is but a beginning. To much of the church, salvation is only a ticket of out of hell, not into the fullness of Canaan. Coming out of Egypt is entirely other than coming into Canaan, coming into Christ. There's a journey. You know that. They had to cross the wilderness. And then they had to go into Canaan and take it, fight for it wasn't handed to them. Conflict surrounds this thing. Why much of the church is bought into this concept that salvation is all it is to it? Because it doesn't like the conflict. doesn't like the battle that comes with pressing on, comes with transformation, comes with conformity. The restraining of the soul is not appreciated in the church anymore so that the Spirit may come forth. This dominion switch of living in our souls versus the Lord living in our spirit, reigning over our souls, bringing it into subjection to the Spirit of Christ in our spirit, subjecting our soul and our flesh to God is not appreciated in the church anymore. God's after divine order in this thing. He always has been. He's after his purpose. That which God is eternally purpose, he's working unto. He's pushing us into, pushing us unto. If we will allow ourselves to be stretched, if we allow ourselves to be conformed, if we will allow ourselves to be transformed, if will we go, will we go through the process of that? Will we de- become on this journey of the bride that God has called us to? Will you take that journey? Because you're saved. Salvation is unto getting back to the original purpose. That's all it is. We've made it everything. Hear what I'm trying to say here. Ten years after this church here at Philippi was begun, Paul's writing through Aphrodite, sending this epistle back to them. 
through Ephroditus to press them on beyond what they'd experienced ten years before. So here we are, folks. Let's hit this just a little bit more, then I, I will press on, actually, in the message. I press on in order that I may lay hold, verse 12, of that for which also I was laid hold of. Paul's saying this, God got a hold of me, and there's a purpose involved in this. Beyond salvation, you know that. That's not what he's talking about here. He's not talking about salvation. He's talking about knowing the Lord. He's talking about the power of his resurrection life in him. There's so much I could attach to this. Why Elijah had to go to the widow of Zarephath under the hand of God. And why it was important that that widow's son die. Was so that Elijah would be made aware of the power of his resurrection. Death surrounded Elijah. So that. Here's what was really going on. Death was at work in Elijah and around Elijah so that the Lord's life could be made manifest. That's just putting it in New Testament order. Verse 14. Verse 13, excuse me. Brethren, I do not... Regard myself as, laying, as having laid hold of it yet. But one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind. Reaching forward. Notice the language, reaching forward. He's not talking about salvation. I keep harping on this, but it's important that we understand what's going on here. He's talking about fullness. He's talking about full and original intent, original purpose. It's what the entire book of Ephesians is about, original intent, original purpose. Before the fall of man. Reaching forward to what lies ahead, I press on towards the goal. That Greek word means there is an aim. There is a bullseye down here. And we're to be shooting straight for it. It's out in front of us. It's not salvation, which is past. It's in front of us still. There is an aim in this. I'm just going to do this real quick. For the prize of what? The upward, that's the heavenly call. That's actually what it means. A heavenly calling of God in Christ Jesus. Ties in with what I said last night. Hebrews chapter 3. Companions of a heavenly calling. That heavenly calling only begins here at salvation. That's not its ending. The purpose, the aim of God is more than that. So, all right. Now, let's look at Galatians chapter 4 for a second. Verse number 19. I'll just jump on this one for a second. I want us to, to see some things here. What's going on in the Apostle Paul's life? <clears throat> and I don't have time to go through the entire book of Galatians and we take all night and tomorrow night and the night after that. But verse 19 of Galatians 4. My children, notice his language there. It's not an offhand remark. He calls them children. My children. With whom? I am again in, let's just translate it rightly, I am in the birth pains until Christ is formed in you. Travail is birth pains. Whenever God is about to birth a revelation of purpose of himself, of his purpose, of his intention. He leads the way with travail. Every time. Every time. Whenever something has been lost, which is the case of not only what's in the Old Testament, but in much of the New. When the mystery eternal mystery or secret of God revealed to the holy apostles and prophets of the New Testament gets lost. 
Whenever the church comes into a lowest state of things, whenever God's people are in a place of spiritual captivity, in an earth order of divine worship, so to speak, whenever man, I mean that in a generic sense, not in a gender issue, whenever man gets in control of worship, of the church, whenever that happens, brings the church into a man order, Behind it all is Satan. Whenever that happens, guess what? The Lord only allows for that to go on for so long before he moves to recover his testimony, his name, a people of his name, his glory. There's no substitute for that. We've become so, listen, I don't mean this critical, but we've become so uh, lacking in our in the presence of the glory of the Lord in and among us both. That most of our children have grown up never experiencing the glory of God that pins you to your to the floor until you can't get up and you don't want to get up. Where the fear and the terror of the Lord is life altering and life changing. And we've substituted that for a little blessing and a word of encouragement. But there's no transformation in those things the way they're going on right now. We remain the same old buzzards in the same old cage. We've not been made free. Though we've preached the gospel of just setting people free. But if we're not internally made free, we're just loosing buzzards into the earth. It's a fact. The buzzards just defecate on everybody around them. The same old vomit that they've been eating and living off of, of death for years and years and years. And where does that pattern get broken up? We need, brothers and sisters, the divine interruption of God in our regularly scheduled programs. Are you with me in that? I'm pushing for it. If I'm pushing for something, it's that. In the church at large. I'm not just saying this to you. I'm saying it everywhere I go. I'm required to say it. And I'm not ashamed to say it to you. I'm telling you, you ask the Lord about it. I'm telling you, God's heart in this is not a blessing mode. God's heart in this is to get us back to His original intent and purpose. That's what He's always pushing us into. Pushing us forward. That's what Paul's talking about in Philippians 3. He's pressing on. He's pressing the church at Philippi. Onward, onward, onward. There's no place to just come aside and rest. Not to be disengaged with the Lord. I'm calling us to be engaged with the living God. To allow the transforming, life-altering power of the Holy Spirit to come into us. To ransack and bring His eternal change. How about that? Salvation's not a blessing. It's an entirely other than life. And if we go with it, we become something that we were meant to become. One with the Lamb. There's no other way in this. The bride's not just saved. She is wholeheartedly given over and has been conformed to His image. Anyway. Paul's praying is along those lines. He's in labor of the churches in Galatia until Christ be formed. He's in travail. The the, the travail of God is upon him again. This isn't an Old Testament concept. He's in travail. Travail is extraordinarily important in this day. This is a day for travail. I say that to you from the Spirit of Christ. This is a day for travail. Without travail, we're not going to see happen in our nation what we wish to see happen. Listen. Travail is not just about me. It's about Him. It's not just about this church. It's about the church. It's 
So, now let's switch gears for a second along these lines of travail. I'll be as quickly as a, a quick as I can. The Holy Spirit, help us. We ask you to do that, Holy Spirit. Help us. I know there's a lot in this to digest. Little time, but a massive, what is needed in us is a massive release of the Holy Spirit. In a transforming way of our minds, our minds to be transformed to the mind of Christ, to the mind of the Lamb, the mind of the Lord. I don't need to tell you this, but I'm going to say it every, anyway. When you look at the major moves of God in the Scriptures, they're always preceded by travail and repentance. Every time. Jesus himself came preaching repentance. John the Baptist was immersion of repentance to make ready a people for the Lamb who was coming out. It's not an option, it's a requirement. Daniel, I just want to hit this real quick. Daniel is in deep repentance in Daniel 9. Yes. Repenting. Travail is upon the man. When you read chapter 9, travail has come upon him. Same thing with Esther, chapter 4. Mordecai makes her to understand because he's her father now. Her, her parents are dead in the natural. So Mordecai wants her to understand why she's strategically there at that time in God. Travail comes upon her to the point that she says, look, I'm, I'm going to get my maids and we're going to pray. You have everybody praying for me. I'm going to go before the king uninvited, which was a, a, a certainty of death. But if I die, I die. I tell you that's travail. Her life is on the line for the sake of the Lord's testimony and his people. Having a people of his name survive. Travail comes upon uh, Ezra in the book of Ezra, 8 through 10. Because of the mixture that's among God's people. Mixed marriages represent something in the scripture. A lack of wholehearted devotion to the Lord. That's what it represents. It's not about just having a mixed marriage. That's not God's problem. God's problem is that our hearts are divided. We love something equal with Him. Or more than Him. Travail hits Ezra. He's ripping the beard right in front of everybody. Here's what people don't like, by the way. Just let me get to this. We're too, we're too proud to let God do that to us. It's true. I'm not trying to offend you. Well, maybe I am. But not in, not to, I'm not demeaning. I'm not saying it that way. That's not hear my heart in this. Pride's in our way in this thing. We don't want to look abnormal. Let me ask you in God, what is normal? Ezra is on his face in front of everybody, ripping the beard, hair of his beard out, and the hair of his head out, wailing on the ground in travail because of the mixture in God's people. Let me tell you, I don't know how to say this in a good way. Just forgive me for saying it wrongly. We are such and such mixture and compromise, and I don't hear anybody wailing. What is wrong in this picture? I don't even hear people asking for it anymore. We've become so accustomed to this lifelessness and death that has come up. So Jeremiah 9, death has come up into our windows. Here's what they were commanded. Call for the wailing women. I'm not saying that is a gender issue. Call for the bride. The bride understands the eternal purpose in the heart of God. She will never be satisfied. She's too discontent with the way of things and the way the church has become and the way the kingdom of God in Western culture of Christianity is being misrepresented. She's too discontented with that nonsense. She will never cave in, never give in. She will never be content until God got His name back among His people to the testimony of Christ in fullness is back among the nations to where the glory of the presence of the God of glory is back among His people. That alone instilled fear in the nations around them so that at their approach the nations were in terror. 
Jericho was shut up in fear because of the approach of the people of God. They're laughing at us. Are we okay with that, brothers and sisters? I'm asking for the arising of the Holy Spirit in this hour to move us off of our butts and back to our knees. Amen. I need to be shaken. You need to be shaken. We need to be shaken for the sake of our children. Jeremiah 9. For the sake of our nation, this thing's bigger than me. I'm not saying this in a self-centered way. I'm not saying, oh, I just I want to be able to have this and this. No, I'm saying this to us. The hope of God lies in travail. And I don't see it right now in the measure that God wants it to, to be released. I am told by the Lord directly to call the church, present the seed of travail from the Lord Himself, and call the church back to it. The Lord asked me a very straightforward question. Do you know what your nation would look like if you had two years of solid travail? No, I don't know what it will look like. I aim to find out. There is something that must be done in this. And it's going to demand willingness on our parts. There's a demand in this. There's a cost to this. Anybody tells you otherwise is selling something. There's a cost to this, brothers and sisters. There's a demand to it. Some of us for far too long have been checked out. We've been wounded. Who hasn't been? Can I just touch that? We've become so accustomed to our pity, we're dying in it now. You can either revel in your pity or let the Lord deliver you from your pity. Self-pity. I mean, I know Dennis will amen this one. Self-pity is the bane of the church in this hour. We're wanting pity instead of deliverance. Say, I've been wounded. Listen, just ask Dennis. This is the truth. You know what it means to be a leader? Put a bullseye on your chest and tell everybody to shoot. Isn't that right, Gene? I'm not complaining about it. To live is Christ, to die is gain. I'm not kidding. I'm going too long on this. That's not the way to get rid of all this. I'm saying if you want your pity, stay in it. But if you want deliverance, come out to the Lord in this thing. Don't stay isolated from one another. I said that last night. I'll say it again. Don't become a malcontent that gets into rebellion. That's where it heads. Become discon- Let discontentedness lead us to involvement. Amen. Can you hear that? Become one with Him. Come into God's solution in this. Ask Him for travail and watch Him give it to you, but don't despise its seed form, the day of small beginnings. Daniel's travail led to the first wave and the second wave and the third wave of a recovery of getting God's people out of Babel. And I just have to say this. God, the Holy Spirit, here's the time we're in, is trying to get a people, His people, out of Babylon and back to the Lord. To come out of the government of Babylon, which is confusion. Tell me that's not going on in the American church. That's what it means. Babel means confusion. And the ultimate end of the Tower of Babel is the government of Babylon which is where God took his people because that's where they already were inwardly. He simply put them where they were. He was the one who directed Nebuchadnezzar. In in Ezekiel, you can read it. Chapter 21, to go to Jerusalem and destroy it. The Lord did. Say, well, he won't do that today, will he? Will he? You think the Lord won't allow, if if we're unwilling to repent, won't allow, let's say, Isaiah 26 to kick in? Just read it. The nations don't learn righteousness because of His kindness. The nations learn righteousness because of His judgments. It's going down like a right sandwich, isn't it, Demetrius? (laughs) I'm trying to lighten things up before the next hammer blow. Brothers and sisters, we can have something and be a part of something we've never been a part of if we want it. But I'm warning you, there's a cost. Sacrifice is involved in it.
Paul understood the true nature of the lamb. We're given over to death so that life can work in you. That's that nature that wins by its sacrifice. The bride is the bride of the lamb because that nature that's not of this earth is now in her, filling her. The very nature of the lamb. What am I saying that for? To say this to us. If we want the nature of the lamb, God's going to look straight to us as his bride to become a vessel of recovery. So Daniel chapter 9 is in travail. The ministry of divine authority is being manifested in Daniel's praying. How does that work? Works this way. God finally has in Daniel a vessel who understands the times that he's living in. Since this is really important what I'm about to say. Secondly, in Daniel, God has a vessel who understands his purpose, God's purpose, and is perfectly aligned with God in that purpose. In true prayer. That is not praying out of our minds, but allowing the Spirit to pray through us. It's exactly what Paul said about it. Thirdly, perhaps most importantly, God has in Daniel, singularly, a vessel that is underneath his hand. Here's what I want to say to us about that. You make the choice whether you're willing to go down this path. Under his hand, like Elijah was under his hand. So that the first prophetic word publicly that Elijah ever uttered, chapter 17 of 1 Kings, was a divine authority word. I'm shutting up the heavens so that it doesn't rain and it won't even do except by my word. There's other prophets and none of them could change that in that day. We're about to see that in the earth again. Not through a singular vessel, through a company of God's people that he's putting his hand upon. But the requirement is that he put his hand on us. And that this is that hand. And underneath that hand is the divine discipline, the governmental discipline of God, where he restricts the vessel to where that vessel has no freedom of its own, let's say it this way, of its own interests, but God's interests alone. That's absolutely necessary, lest pride and arrogance get involved again, what we've seen in the past, with the vessel. So that when Elijah makes the prophetic pronouncement in 1 Kings 17, the next prophetic word to him is, Hide yourself at the brook Cherith. You know what we would do in this day? We'd make that kind of prophetic announcement and then put it all over the internet. Build our ministry. God's next move is to go hide yourself by the brook Cherith. He's under the hand of God. It's not optional. It's mandatory. Life and death is hanging over Elijah in this issue. That's a tough one, isn't it? We don't think God acts that way. Boy, are we deceived. Listen, folks, this is just par for the course. You can't be used of God to make those pronouncements if you're not living in the reality of that kind of dealing with God. Few will make the journey under the hand of God to become that kind of vessel because we don't want to be restricted. We want our way. Brook dries up. He doesn't have permission to leave until God says leave, though. Then he goes, go to the widow Zarephath, Sidon, the very birthplace, that country of Jezebel. He's under the hand of God. He goes. I'm saying all this to get to a point. And then it happens. What's been termed by most preachers, the greatest move of God in that time, 1 Kings 18 is the greatest failure of Israel in any time. 
Let me tell you why. Because God forms a showdown. It's coming. I'm, I'm saying this for a purpose. It's coming in our time. I warn you, it's coming. There's a lot of reasons why I can tell you why. I'm not going to get into it all right now. Maybe another time. I'll get into it in Dixon. I want to come to the conference. <laughs> May not want to after this. First Kings 18, mighty showdown. Elijah is told by the Lord, get the prophets of Baal, get the 450 of them, get the prophets of Asherah, get them all together. Call them out. They're all being fed at a governmental level at Jezebel's table. It used to be in David's time that the prophets and the priests were fed at that table. Now, the false prophets are. What the threat is, is that the testimony of God again is going to be wiped completely off the earth, Gene. That's the threat. Suddenly, God's ready for a showdown. Get the prophets of Baal and the prophets, 400 prophets of Asher out of here. Only the 450 prophets of Baal come, though. The other 400 prophets of Asherah, Asherah being the mother of Baal, who supposedly killed her husband so that she could have dominion. That's their wicked belief. Don't show up. Showdown occurs, you know. Elijah's toying with them. You call on your God. Here's what he says to the whole nation that's assembled there. It's what God's saying to us. How long are we going to be divided between two opinions? If the Lord's God, folks, let's go after him wholeheartedly. If he's not, just get, get lost in your stuff. See what that does for you. That's a showdown. It's coming to a theater near you. Divine authority. God's had enough. He loves us enough to discipline us. Loves us enough to correct us. Loves us enough to shake this nation. You believe that? You better. I'm telling you, He loves us enough to shake this nation. Loves us enough to let us be invaded, if that's what it takes to get us to repent. Loves us enough to have limited nuclear exchange along the eastern seaboard. It's what the Lord's shown me, the threat of, if we're not willing to repent. We will determine the extent to which the Lord goes to. Loves us enough to allow civil war in our nation and secession again and the breaking up of the states, if that's what it takes to get us to repentance. Can't blame that on God. I'm not talking about some distant time. Now, where am I the only one saying it? It's been shown it. I know friends way over in other nations have been shown the very same things without us corroborating. Listen, that's not what God wants, but we're going to make a choice as to what it takes. If He can't awaken us by a kiss, He'll go straight to shaking. Kindness doesn't do it, then lead us to repentance. Guess what? Severity will. But we'll make the choice. We're already making it. We're making it at a governmental level. Listen, I, this is going to be hard for us to hear, but we need to hear it. Here's what happens. 1 Kings 18. Showdown occurs. Nothing happens. They call upon their God. Nothing happens. No fire falls. That's the sign. When the fire falls, whoever causes the fire to fall, they're God. Nothing happens. They're cutting themselves. They're doing all this stuff. You know, it, Elijah then, when all that's over, he rebuilds the altars, the altar of the God of their fathers. That's the uh, Malachi 4 passage coming into view. Twelve stones. And he calls upon the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He calls upon the God of their fathers. So yes, Malachi 4. Turn the hearts of the children back to the God of their fathers. We think it's a generational move. It is not. 
It is a move of our hearts back to the God of our fathers. The only hope is that our hearts reconnect with God. Isn't that true, Jacob? Not that we can reconnect with one another. Not first. I'm for every generational move that the Lord needs to do, but the primary move of God is going to be our hearts back to Him. That's what John the Baptist is doing. That's the true ministry of the Spirit and power of Elijah, is to turn hearts back to God, to lead a baptism of repentance back to God. I cannot stress that strong enough. Amen. Our nation needs to get back to God. Is that not true? Isn't that true, Paul and Sherry? What do we need? A move back to my heart needs to be back with the Lord in this thing. It's the only hope for our nation. Our hope isn't in government, is it? Our hope isn't man's strength, is it? Our hope isn't in our defense. If our hope is in our defense, i got the word of the Lord for you. The Soviet Union will rise again and invade this nation. Who did I hear that from? Gabriel. You want to hear any more? I'm glad to tell you. Soviet Union is going to rise again. And they are angry. Anyway, forget I said that so you can sleep peacefully. No, we need travail, folks. I'm telling you. So Elijah rebuilds the altar to God of the fathers. Then in verse 36 and verse 37 of 1 Kings chapter 18. Now, Lord, let your fire fall, that we may know that their hearts have turned back to you. Fire falls. Licks up the stones, licks up the water, licks up everything. And the people cry out, God, the Lord, He is God, He is God. But it's not lasting. It's the greatest failure you'll ever see, one of the greatest failures you'll ever see in the Scripture. It is vocal repentance, but not transformational repentance. How do you know that, Terry? Because of what happens next. Because then an edict is released from Jezebel. I'm going to kill you, Elijah. Elijah's not afraid of Jezebel. Elijah has had enough. Just let me explain what's going on here. Some of us have been tempted the same way. I've been, I've been very zealous for you, Lord, and these people are completely unrepentant. They did not kill the other prophets of Asherah. They did not bring Jezebel and Ahab down. And as long as those demons under their charge have a right to the government of this nation, it is all futile. I'm out of here. That's what happened. And as long as the demons that are in charge of our nation right now are allowed to stay in charge, we're spitting in the wind in this thing. That's a fact, Jack. Elijah understood it. I'm out of here. And he does something that he's not allowed to do. Run. He's meant to stay under the hand of God. And you know the story. He runs and God strengthens him in the journey. The journey's too great for you, son. Eat this. He gets to this place, the cave, which, by the way, here's a sign to us. A few months ago, a mosque was blown up. And guess what was revealed under the mosque? The cave that Elijah fled to. Let's discern our times. So I'm telling you, the spirit and power of Elijah has come out. And Elijah himself has been unleashed. True sign. Elijah gets to the cave and God has a very direct question. What are you doing here? He doesn't have the option to run. If you stay under the hand of God, you are restricted in your freedom. You do not have the option to do what you want to do. God cannot entrust himself to a vessel that is not willing to come underneath his hand. That is a divine order issue. Let me say it again. God cannot fully entrust himself to a vessel that is unwilling to come under the divine hand of God and find our own legitimate freedoms restricted. You will not have the freedom to run. You won't have the freedom to have your way in this. You won't have the freedom to have your own interest in it. I know this is heavy. We're not you know, let's say this because we don't hear it. 
We just hear about happy things and glorious things, and we're, we're dancing around. And the hell, hell is coming up in our streets and in our cities and our nation in an unprecedented way, and we're living in a fantasy world. We're not awake. We're not sober. Tell me that's not true. Somebody somewhere has got to rise up and the Lord, voice of the Lord has got to strike like lightning again in our midst and call us to wake up. Wake up. Become sober-minded in this thing. For the sake of our nation and the nations, awaken people of God. Let God arise in this hour, in us. Are you with me in that? I cannot go on as business as usual. I refuse to go on as business as usual. I refuse to succumb and say, well, so be it. Homosexuality is rising up and this is rising up and this is being governed by our nation and the church is asleep. Oh, well, I'm not okay with this. I will never be okay with this and they'll have to carry my dead carcass out. I'm telling you that. I'm ready for it. How many in this room are ready? Look, if I live, I live. If I die, I die. That's Esther. But something's got to go on in this nation. I'm not trying to stir our emotions. I'm trying to stir us by the Spirit of Christ to get before God and say, Lord, give me travail. Because travail means God's going to birth His testimony back among His people again. And He'll come straight to us, His people. It's on our watch that this nonsense has come up. I'm not pointing the finger at our government. They're not responsible for the spiritual life of our nation. We are. If anything, God's given us what we deserve. Forget I said that too. Listen, folks. We need a shaking. We need an awakening. I refuse to be silent. If we are silent now, God will find some other vessel. Make that the prophecy around your life. If you shut up, if you cave in to it now, God will go straight to another vessel. I will not be silent. Amen. What's going on, Terry? The lion's in the room. He's the lamb, but I tell you in battle, he's the lion. And he's standing in the room right now. Aslan is not tame. We only think he is. We only think we can get him to do what we want to do. We don't know what it means to be under the hand of God. I want to be under the hand of God, Gene. I refuse to be under man's hand. I won't be placated. I won't be manipulated. I'll be under the hand of God or dead, one or the other. Anybody with me in that? How many want to be under the hand of God in this hour? How many understand the seriousness of this hour can discern the times we're in? If you're a weatherman and can see what's going on out there, why can't we understand the hour we're living in? Why can't we understand the times we're living in? Why can't we understand that God wants to just do something greater than visit us? He wants to come among us and recover and restore His own testimony and power. Listen, I want to say something to you. A little bit frightening, but but it's needed to say this. I've been saying a lot of frightening things. If we have the glory of the presence of God and the fear and the terror of the Lord among us, He will strike fear into our government again. You touch my people and I'll kill you. I'm telling you that from the Lord. I'm not after everybody getting killed. I'm after a testimony that says, look, oh yeah, go ahead and do what you want to do. There are consequences to this. China thought they could wipe the Christians out. One in ten people in that nation are now believers. There's over a hundred million believers in that nation. That's what happens. So I'm trying to encourage us in this. For the love of God that's in us and that we've tasted of and we've eaten of and we've partaken of in Him, may He move us onto His purpose now. May we stop being babies in this. May we not be weak and whippy and effeminate in this hour. Can you hear that from the Lord? This is not TV preacher time. 
We're not needing more encouragement. We're not needing a deeper life conferences. We're not needing those things that just placate us and make us feel good about ourselves. We need the ministry of divine authority to strike in this hour to awaken His people. Without it, our nation is hopeless. It's lost. That's serious, isn't it? It is serious, Sonny. More serious than what I'm telling you. I'm not telling you a lot of things I already know. From the Lord. There's so much more to this. I plead with you before the living God to not let this be business as usual. We're out of whatever church you're from tonight. Not let this be business as normal. Don't come to church so you can feel good about yourself. Become the church that is awakened 24-7. As awake in your home as you are here, more so. Can you hear me? Well, that's what's needed in this hour. <clears throat> anyway, so, so we stand at this, this time and this specific time, this juncture. And let me tell you what's going on. Whether I will have a nation or not is what's in front of us. Whether we'll divide and be conquered. But it's much deeper than that. God's original intent for this nation is in view in this. To have a nation of nations. To have a refuge to where at least this was true. To where His gospel could be welcomed here without fear of interference without fear of persecution, and thus become a sheep nation to take His gospel to the ends of the earth. Original intent. So we see travail then, not as an option, as mandatory in this time. God is looking, Ezekiel chapter 22, for a vessel that will stand in the gap in this hour, will become a wall. The sad part of Ezekiel 22 is, he says, and I found none, therefore I will destroy. Ezekiel chapter 21, verse number 27 I can't go into all the context of that. It's God talking to him about his coming judgment. It's called, it's known in the old days, that's passage, chapter 21, as the song of the sword. It was actually sung. The song of the sword. The sword of the Lord is lifted up over his own house. Verse 27, here's what God says to his own people. I will overturn. I will overturn. I will overturn. Until whose right it is comes. The sword of the Lord is over us right now. He is overturning everything that is not His purpose. His fullness. His heart. May God press our hearts in this onward. May I never again be okay. I don't know what it is. Say what you want to about this. I'm not saying this is right. I'm just saying this to you. We've become so dull and dulled down. Nothing seems to get us on our knees. Nothing seems to shake us awake anymore. We watch sweeping, radical changes going on in our nation on every level. We're sound asleep, I'm afraid. That can change. It's meant to change in this room. 
in our hearts tonight. God doesn't win by many. He wins by few. Only 300. He'll reduce the number. 10,000 are too many. You'll think you'll do it in your own strength. Let me get down to 300 of you. Then I'll rout the enemy. And then all the other people will come running out and chase them after I've done the work. We think God wins by many. He never does. He wins by few. You think that you're unimportant. I'm telling you, you're not. God, Christ in you, is the difference maker. Listen, I was born to be a warrior. I was born for times like this. I get excited in these kinds of times. I'm up for a fight. How about you? I don't mean against one another. I mean against our true. We're not wrestling against flesh and blood here. Behind what's going on in our nation and the nations is the devil himself. Are you up for a fight? The bride is a warrior. She is. Esther learns that. Book of Esther. God's going to sovereignly move. He's going to extend the scepter to Esther because he loves her. But his command is fight. Fight. Isn't that true, Paul? Isn't that true, Sherry? How many in this room are warriors? Well, that's a great response. Okay, <laughs> come on, put your hands up. How many in this room are warriors? How many want to be warriors? We're not a bunch of wimps, are we? I know you've never heard preaching like this. It's about time that we did. Are we wimps or warriors? We're going to decide which one we are. For such a time as this, God predestined that we should live in this time, knowing that He would be greater in us than what's going on in this world. You were meant to be here. And we're either going to shrink back or we're going to allow the Lord to rise up in us. We need a revolution in His house in this hour. Would you agree with that? An awakening to come about. Wake us up, Lord. Arise, O oh God. Scatter the enemy out of us. Deliver us. Purify your people, O oh God. Call, this is Jeremiah now. Call for the wailing women. Let them come. Call for the wailing women. Now, I'm going to say it differently. Call for the wailing bride. Let her come forth. Let her come forth. This is an hour for birthing. This is an hour for travail. This is a moment for travail. All true ministry begins with the burden of the Lord. And travail carries the burden of the Lord. Do you have it? Do you want it? Do you want the burden of the Lord? How many, come on, let me see your hand. How many want the burden of the Lord in this? I want the burden of the Lord in this thing. So, Lord, you see our hands. Give us your burden in this thing, Lord. Supernaturally, I pray for the impartation of the Holy Spirit, of the very burden burden of the living God, that your purpose must be brought forth in the earth. You will have your testimony in fullness in this earth again. You will have your name not to be a byword, but to strike fear in the nations again. You will have a people of your name, a bride who's given up her own name to take the name that's above every name, that at that name every knee bows and every tongue confesses. We'll see your glory again, Lord, in this hour. A people who want you, your glory among them. That the distinction and the difference of the body is the glory of the the God of glory in the midst. That the eternal purpose of the eternal Godhead be realized in this moment of time. In this great battle, this final battle here at the end of this age. I ask, Lord, for the warriors of God to arise, and you to arise as a mighty warrior. I ask for the Lord of hosts to present Himself in this hour, to call us forth, to call us out. Shake us out of lethargy. Shake us awake, O Lord. Shake us awake. Arise, O God. Arise. Arise, people of God. Arise in this hour. Shake us out of slumber. Shake us out of sleep. Shake us out of distractions. Shake us, God. Shake us. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. We would ask, this is part of the Lord's purpose right now over us, we would ask for your hand. Upon us as a congregation, congregations, and individually. 
We welcome your hand to rest upon us right now. We willingly come underneath the hand of the Lord. We're not the bride for people. We're the bride for the Lamb. We are His and no others. We will not give our heart to another. We will not allow our hearts to leave our first love, Jesus, the Lamb. Put your hand upon us, Lord, right now. We ask for the divine discipline of God upon our hearts. The divine discipline of God on our minds. The divine discipline of God over our actions. We welcome it tonight. We welcome it. Restrict us. Restrict our flesh. Restrict our soul. Restrict our stubbornness. Restrict our pride. Restrict our strength so that you may be strong. We confess our weakness, God. When we truly see things, what we've noted as strength is great weakness in us. Pride and arrogance. It's resisted your great purpose and strength. We say no more, O God. Arise in us. Strike, Holy Spirit. Strike. Strike the arrogance. Strike the pride. Strike the strength of our mind so that the mind of Christ may flood us now. Strike physical strength so that spiritual strength may be ours. Strike natural strength so that your eternal strength may be in us. The divine person of the Lamb. Tear out of our hands our control, our manipulation. And place us into the hands of the Almighty. We declare that we are children and you're the Ancient of Days. And we bow before you and cry out, Ancient of Days, forgive us, for we are but children. In speech we are children. In knowledge we are children. In understanding we are children. You are the Ancient of Days. Have mercy upon our hearts. Have mercy upon us, God, for pride and arrogance has come up into our hearts and minds. And we repent. We repent of our arrogance and our pride of what we think we know. Our cry is Philippians 3. We would know you. And we would forsake everything else to the surpassing greatness of knowing you tonight, Lord. You alone satisfy us, and we bow before you tonight in humbleness, Lord, asking for your true humility to be established in us, and that the offense of pride will be removed from our hearts and minds. Emancipate us from pride. Emancipate us from arrogance. Our nation, Lord, boasts in its pride, in its possessions, in its military might. We repent of our pride, Lord. You have forever been our protection and our deliverance. We, your people, Lord, trust you and entrust ourselves to you tonight in a fresh way. I ask in this room tonight, Lord, for the energizing of the Holy Spirit to re-engage our hearts where we've been disconnected, disengaged with your solution in our times. Forgive us of running and hiding when you never gave us permission to do that to begin with. We would come back under your hand where we left it. I tell you from the Lord, I'm not just saying these things. That's exactly what the Lord has to say to some of us. We ran away and we've been looking for the will of God again. And it's right back where we left, where we first ran and hid. 
We repent before you tonight, Lord, of running, of coming out from under your hand and taking our own wheels up again, Lord. We repent. Forgive us of becoming the very thing once we said we would never allow ourselves to become. The status quo church filled with strong personalities but lacking the glory of the Almighty. Forgive us, O God. These are not my people. They're yours. The bride belongs to the bridegroom. And help me to never forget it, Lord. We repent of our lack of concern spiritually. We repent of our lack of involvement, of discerning your heart in this time, of understanding the time we're living in and what you want to do. And being moved to take action in this hour. We repent. We repent of medicating ourselves on enter- entertainment and the pleasures of this life. Allowing those things to become substitutes for being engaged with you, Lord. Lord. Free our hearts from this, Lord, and restore your God balance in these things. We repent, Lord, for taking and making the time for everything but waiting upon you and humbling ourselves before you. We repent where our jobs have become God to us. We repent, Lord, where pleasure has become our God, where entertainment has become our God. We repent. We repent of the man-pleasing spirit that's come up into our hearts, Lord. We repent of wanting to have our way rather than you, Lord, getting what you, the eternal Lamb of God, have the right. You gave yourself... And we are determined with a holy determination that you'll have your way, that you'll get what you paid the price for. You'll have a wholehearted bride, undeterred, unmoved by the cares and and the temptations of this life. We would set our own hearts like flint back towards you, Lord, and movable. I ask you to go deep, deep. Let deep call to deep. Can you just do that before the Lord? Lord, let deep call to deep in the roar of your waterfalls tonight. We weren't born for shallowness. We were born for the depth and the height and the breadth and the width and to know the love of God that surpasses understanding that we may be filled to all the fullness of God. We ask for that tonight, Holy Spirit. Let deep call to deep again in the roar of your waterfalls. Let your voice go deep within us and summons our hearts. Crush these walls, these barriers that's kept us from the love of God and the love of others. The walls we've erected have become prisons for our hearts. We may be safe, but we're slaves. Break the power of it tonight, Lord. If you can't be hurt, you can't love. May God break the power of that tonight, Lord. Break the power of it tonight. 
We ask that, Holy Spirit. Break self-pity off of our hearts. I know that's a hard one, but Lord, do it. Break self-pity off of our hearts tonight, Lord. We're not going any longer, Lord, lay there and squirming in self-pity. We want the deliverance of the Holy Spirit in our hearts. We want to be made free, not be pitied. We ask for that tonight, Lord. I ask, Father, there's enough of us in this room to directly affect the path of this nation. I ask that your faith would arise in us under this fact. You're looking for vessels. The eyes of the Lord are searching to and fro throughout the whole earth, looking for those whose hearts are made perfect toward Him. God is looking for a vessel in this time, Ezekiel 22, to stand in the gap and become a wall. We say amen. Can you just say that back to us? So be it. Let's answer as Isaiah said. Let's, let's let it be a shout out of our lips. Here am I, O oh God. Here am I. I say yes, and I will never say no to you again. Only yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, Lord. Arise, O oh God, arise. Arise, O oh God, arise. Arise in your people. You with us as a majority to turn hearts back in this nation. To make ready a people for the Lamb in this time. Arise, O oh God. No longer will we allow the lies to keep us from understanding that one in God is a majority in this thing. And we're meant to be of one mind, one heart, one people, one spirit, one faith, one baptism, one love. Arise, O God, arise. Break the power of division and divisiveness among the peoples of God in this hour. May we stop the pointing of the finger and the accusation. Arise, O God. This is not a time to accuse. It's a time to humble ourselves. Not a time to pray just that others will awaken. I want to be awakened. I must be awakened, O God. Awaken me. Awaken my family, parents, that God will awaken our children Children, that God will awaken our parents. Turn our hearts back to God. Turn our hearts back to God. Arise, O God. Break the power of stubbornness in my heart. Break its power. Thank you, Lord. In this very room tonight, you have your beginning, Lord. In Nicholas County, God can have His beginning tonight. Something that's meant to spread supernaturally. Us being awakened means that others can be awakened. We'll become vessels of that. Lord, we give ourselves to You to be vessels of that very thing. Lord, we don't care what church they go to. We take care that they become the church. And that, Lord, they not be isolated and insulated. But together, together, Lord, together, Lord, we become that one body, that one people, that one house, that one nation that you called us to be, Lord. Ask for that, Lord. It's not the structures of men that we're after. It's the eternal mind and purpose and will of the Almighty, of the Ancient of Days Himself, the Lamb's very bride, the Lamb's church, the Lamb's Lamb's house, the Lamb's body.
the temple of the Holy Spirit, the Father's house, the Lamb's bride. Forgive us, Lord. Forgive us. Forgive us, Lord. Of Isaiah 58 and the pointing of the finger. Forgive us for allowing the accuser of the brethren to operate in my heart, in our hearts. Forgive us, God. Accusation isn't deliverance. No longer, Lord, we repent. We repent. We are people of unclean lips. And we repent before You, O God. We repent before You. We give You permission to put reins, to rain, to bridle our tongues. We give you permission, Holy Spirit, to bridle our tongues, bring our tongues into subjection so that salt water doesn't come out with pure water. No mixture. No mixture. Forgive us, O God. We've used our tongues to slander. We've used our tongues to accuse. We've used our tongues against our brothers and against our sisters, Lord. Forgive us. Bridle our tongues. Bridle our tongues. Bridle our tongues, O God. We humble ourselves before you. I ask it as Isaiah 6, Lord, that as it were, the tongues from off the altar, Lord, the very fiery coal would touch our lips. Cleanse our lips. Cleanse our tongues. Thank you, Lord. I see the hand of the Lord over us, brothers and sisters. We just stay under His hand for just a little bit longer. We are under Your hand. I pray that the hand of God now would come down upon us individually as in the day of Pentecost in fire. So the tongue of fire come down not only over the whole, but upon each individual as well. Your hand come down upon us right now. We would be under your hand. I ask for the weightiness of your hand to be upon us, Lord. There's a weight to this. Weightiness. Heaviness. Thank you for it, Lord. The weight of the presence of God upon our bodies even. Burn, Holy Spirit, burn. Consuming fire, burn. Purify us, purify us. Purify us as a people. Lord, teach us the beauty of silence, quietness. Teach us how to be quiet long enough to hear you and keep on hearing you in that silence, in that quietness. Forgive us of talking without listening. The saying the Lord declares when the Lord has not spoken. We come under your hand, Lord. We come under your hand. Restrict us. We, we gladly welcome your restricting. This is a new day. It's a new hour.
now, Lord. Our hearts are ready, folks. That seed of travail gently placed in our spirit, man. Just a seed, but precious. And I know this will happen, Lord. In the days ahead, travail is going to break forth in your people. Pennsylvania is going to break forth, John. Travail is going to break forth. Here in Nicholas County, travail. It is going to lead the way unto a full recovery. Your burden, Lord. Your burden. We thank you for it. The very burden. Can you feel that for just a second in the spirit? And as we just say it, say it right to your own heart. The burden of the Lord. Where true ministry begins. All true ministry begins with the burden of the Lord himself. What is in his purpose, his mind, his heart, not ours. We receive, we gladly receive your burden. Weighty, weighty, weighty is your burden. But we say yes and we will never stop saying yes. The burden, 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 burden of the Lord. Travail for the burden of the Lord. Holy Spirit, get a people, get us out of Babylon and back under your government. Get us out of the confusion of Babylon. Back into the perfect eternal purpose of the Lamb. We've been so scattered, Holy Spirit. There is a multiplication, multiplication of your presence in our being together intentionally, in our coming together intentionally. Far too long we've given in to the trap of isolationism. No longer. We intentionally grab the hands of our brothers and sisters and say, let's go up to the house of the Lord. Let us become that before you again, Lord. Let us let God reestablish as in the book of Esther. Or Ezra, excuse me, his house. Rebuild your house, O God. Rebuild the house of the Lord, a people of your name, a people of your name. A people of your presence, a people of your glory, a people of distinction, unlike any other people in the earth. People of fullness, a people filled, filled, filled with the Spirit of the living God. Mm. 
Mark us tonight, O oh God. And the Lord's going to do that with you if you want it right now. Mark your people. Go through this room, Holy Spirit, and mark the ones who say yes to you in this moment. Mark us. Mark us in the Spirit. Mark our hearts. And may we never forget, but forever remember that we are the marked ones of God. The marked ones of God in this time. Mark our hearts. Mark our foreheads. Mark us, O God. We say yes. Let the fire of God make His mark upon our foreheads and upon our hearts. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. You don't have to hold it back, Pam. Just let it come forth. Let the glory of the presence of God in the room have His way for once. You can have Your way among us for once, God. We won't restrict You. We won't be afraid. Arise, O God. Arise. Arise, O God. Arise. Mark your people, Holy Spirit. I can see him doing it. He's going through the congregation right now, marking us on the forehead. This one is mine. This one is mine. This one is mine. This one said yes to me. Thank you, Lord. Paul, you and Sherry, I know Paul's standing. Sherry, could would you mind just standing by your husband for a second? I see the mark of God on your foreheads. With a freshness and with it is going to come an intensity. An intensity. I see the Lord visiting you guys at night. Both of you having the same dream. Your eyes awaken in the seasons of the night to see the approach and hear the, the sound of the Lord's footsteps at the doorway of your bedroom. You're marked, you're marked with His mark, His name on you. And His name shall conquer every other name. And those around you at work, in relationships, who've made a name for themselves, the Lord is going to encounter by the glory of His name and give them an opportunity to repent and be a part of Him who has the name that's above every name. I see the sword of the Lord drawn over you two warriors and the cry of battle resounding. It's strange, just that I hear it, the sword for Gideon, the sword for Gideon. Jeff. Just stand, you and your wife, just stand for a second. See the sword of the Lord on you. I'm telling you, you're going to preach like a man from another world. Be a prototype of what can happen on a man and a woman when the glory of God is seen. Because you're a people that are humble, 
the Lord is going to be mighty. And He will be the words in your mouth. And the very oracles of the Lord shall come forth. I mean revelational preaching and teaching. And the sound of a trumpet shall be heard like a blast. Wake up! Wake up! The Lord shall call through you that awakening blast, that summonsing blast. The heavy hand of the Lord is upon you too. This time is a strategic time. God is redeploying, and I'm not talking about geographically. He is redeploying the venue, the venue is changing. You're stepping forward. You're volunteers in the day of His power. Lord, we all want to be that. We volunteer right now. We volunteer in the this day, the day of Your power. Thank you, Lord. I just want us to, could we stand? I want to dismiss us this way. If we can do this. I don't know. This is an attempt to dismiss. Israel did something for remembrance sake. They went out into the middle of the river and they they erected 12 stones as a point of remembrance that they never forget the covenant of God. What they called were called to be in Him as a people, all the tribes. And I'm asking tonight that we wade out into those depths with the Lord And allow God right now to erect in the midst of our hearts and our minds as a people the stones of remembrance. That we not leave here and fall back into the same, oh, same, oh, become enmeshed again in the cares of this life. that this emancipation of the Holy Spirit that's going on in the days ahead come to greater and greater fullness, greater and greater release of the Lord, preparation of the Lord, repentance before the Lord. It's important that we have God's beginning. It's also important that we finish well in this. And don't you want to finish well? We want, Lord, He that's begun a good work in us to bring it to completion, fullness, wholeness. And we'll never settle again for anything less than your fullness and your wholeness in this, Lord. So I call our hearts to remember these stones. We erect them in our hearts before God right now to remember and never forget. Remember and never forget this dedication tonight, this consecration tonight, this commitment tonight, this wholeheartedness to you tonight. Feel the presence of the Lord. He has heard.
Thank you, Lord. Seal our hearts in this and our minds. I just want us just to wait, and I always appreciate the Lord's interruptions. The power of His presence is in the room. It's not slacking, it's growing. I thank you for that, Lord. I don't want to run out when you're not done among us. Lest we forget the power of your presence. Bathe us, immerse us, fill us, baptize us. Repentance is meant to be followed by a baptism of the Spirit in fire. And we say yes to it tonight. I ask for a Pentecost that's seven times greater than Acts 2. That's what Isaiah 30 says. We ask for that tonight. That the light of the sun will be seven times greater than what it was. And that the light of the moon will be greater than the light of the sun. We ask for an an infilling, a baptism, an immersion of the Spirit of the Lamb in fire upon us. Sweep over us right now, our hearts. That fire of God. I'm telling you, I can see the hand of the Lord coming on some of our hearts. It is a release of the Spirit of the Lord's baptism. And fire, 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 consuming fire, fire. The fire of God. Burn, Spirit of the Lord, burn. On your heart, Demetrius, hand of the Lord's on your heart. Burn, Spirit of the Lord. Burn. On your heart, Sherry, burn, Spirit of the Lord. Burn. Chuck, Pam, Spirit of the Lord, that section right back there. See the fire of God resting over you and on your your very uh, hearts for a second here. Burn, Spirit of the Lord. Burn. Wes, up on your heart there. Spirit of the Lord, burn. Burn. Becky, there's a door. Just, I mean, it is swinging rapidly open in front of you. The threshold of God into a whole other than arena that you've never known is in front of you. Just take that step. Cross the threshold. Cross the threshold. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Fire of God's on your back, Chuck, on your back, from at your lower back. I've known things naturally about this. That don't matter right now. The fire of God's on your back nonetheless. It don't matter what I know. It's what the Lord does. Fire of God's on your back, brother. That lower back you've had so much trouble with. Fire of God's on your back. Yes, Lord. Yes. Creative fire of God if on your back. Creative fire of God. Chuck's only a sign. There's others in the room right now. Right back in that section. Fire of God's on some of your back. Sherry, the fire of God's on your back. On your back. 
fire of God. Hand of the fire of God's upon your back. Thank you, Lord. Finger of the fire of God's on your forehead, Paul. Finger of the fire right in the middle, center of your forehead. Thank you for it, Lord. Upon you, Danny, too. Come right back here, right in the middle of your forehead. I, I can see your body temperature going up. <laughs> it looks funny, I'm telling you. It's good, though. Fire of God. I can laugh about this, but anyway, it's good. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Jacob, there's a halo of fire circling around your head right now, brother. I can see that in the spirit, just circling around your head. Incredible clarity, clarity of the mind of Christ just being released to you, released to you. You're going to speak like a man from another world at times. They're going to wonder, where in the world did you get that? The mind of Christ like fires and circling, is circling you right now. The Lord made you to be a messenger, a proclaimer. That demands revelation. You've been crying out to the Lord for fresh revelation. Isn't that right? And the Lord has given you the, the revelation that you've been crying out for right now, of himself, of himself. Thank you for it, Lord. Thank you for it, Lord. That's what Paul said to Timothy. Give yourself wholly to this. Be consumed by it. That's been your heart in this. And the Lord is answering your heart. The Lord will give you the words to spiritually art. Articulate with preciseness. Jumping off onto you too, Fred, by the way. With preciseness, the testimony of God. Thank you for it, Lord. Thank you. I feel the testimony of Jesus is going to ring. Philip, the testimony of Jesus is going to ring from you in an unmeasurable way, with greater and greater depth, fathoms of which have been untouched. Thank you, Lord. Can't remember your name, brother. I'm going to point right at your stomach, okay? Just right. Chad? Point right at your stomach. Now, out of your innermost being is going to flow like an unstoppable river, the torrent of the presence of the Almighty. Because it's not words that really matter, it's the presence of the Almighty. And the Lord's been teaching you about His glory, His presence, and the glory of the presence, the God of glory and presence is going to pour forth from you. You're going to be in the travail of that. It's going to be like birthing in you. <laughs> no matter that you're a man. This is a spiritual birthing. And the birthing of that is going to be upon your time. There are going to be even physical pains associated with it. But nevertheless, it's unto the glory of God in an unrestrained, uncontrolled fashion. You are hungry for His presence and His glory.
God will deliver. I thank you for it, Lord. That's on you too, Chuck. I can feel it. See it. Hungry for the presence. Hungry for the glory of the Lord. The Lord will deliver, brother. I want us all to do something. I want us to turn around and put our hands toward John and his wife right here. The presence of the Lord will be like lightning there in Pennsylvania. Like lightning. Not driving away, but illuminating. His presence will accomplish will accomplish what teaching can't. It will open hearts to the word of the Lord and to the scripture. So the power of your presence radiate from these two. John, Lord, well, even in there in the doctor's office, radiate from him, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Greg, just got to say something to you. I can see you at the keyboard, but I'm telling you, fire was coming off your fingers, brother. You couldn't get to the notes fast enough. It's, a, it's strange. I can't help it. I'm just telling you what I'm saying. You couldn't get to the notes fast enough. You were moving with the Spirit, and there were sounds. In the middle of songs, new sounds are going to start coming. It's going to be really disruptive and look ugly for a while. That's all right. Rhythms and sounds, and God's just going to interrupt us. Be ready for this, church. Give, give grace to Greg as he flows where his fingers come under the anointing direction missionally of the Holy Spirit. And instantaneously, the songs of God are going to flow. The songs of God are going to flow, brother. You've tapped into that before, but I'm telling you, there's coming another endowment of the Spirit of God. And the songs of the Lamb are going to break out. I'm telling you that, Greg, the songs of the Lamb are going to break forth. And the rhythms of the Lamb and the music of the Lamb is going to break forth. Thank you for it. Thank you for Greg, Lord. What a beautiful man he is. Beautiful man of God. I thank you for him, Lord. He and his wife. Thank you for them. Just everybody put your hand towards Greg. I know his wife's not able to be here right now. She was earlier, but thank you, Lord. And oh, beautiful one. You are the giver of the music of heaven and on earth. We give you permission to release the song of the Lamb. Even in the middle of the times of worship, as well as in a secret place and in home. And when he's in the car, we give you permission, Lord. We give you permission. The songs and the rhythms of the Lamb. And it's a token. A token. Something for you too in that Demetrius. I can feel that. Songs of the Lamb. Songs of the Lamb, brother. Songs of the Lamb. Break forth suddenly. The Lord, the Lamb, in the light of the knowledge of the glory of God that's seen in the face of Christ, the Lamb, is going to break open. Songs of the Lamb are coming to your church, brother. I want to tell you right there. Songs of the Lamb are going to break forth, break forth. I can't help it. Like the Spirit of the Lord just... Anyway, Demetrius, get ready to write. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Why do you think we can quit? What do you think? Hard to sometimes. I don't have any idea what time it is. Anybody want to know? (laughs) 
We love you, Lord. We love you. That seems so weak. Language sometimes just don't even do justice to where our hearts are in this thing. We declare you are altogether beautiful. We worship before you. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. May the thresholds even now tremble at your great presence. May the gates, Lord, tremble. May our hearts tremble again. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord. The whole earth be filled with your glory again. Lamb of God, establish your reign on this earth, we pray. Establish your reign in us first. In us and among us. O Lamb of God, establish your eternal reign in your people. Reign in us. Rule in us. Govern us. Govern among us. Lord, govern this earth with your bride in the days ahead. We cry out to you for that, Lord. We anxiously long for the eternal government of of the Lamb whose right it is to rule this planet. We declare that right in your face, Satan. What do you think about that? It is the right of the Lamb to govern this earth. You will never succeed. Ever. Your government, Satan, will fall. Every last one of them will bow their knees to the government of the Lamb. Babylon, folks, is going to fall. Babylon's going to fall. In the church and outside of it. The government of Babylon is coming down. And we'll watch it burn. I thank you for it, Lord. Get your people out of it, though. Get it out of your people. Get it out of me, we ask, Lord. In the name of the Lord Jesus, amen. That's it. (laughs) Bless you. We'll have a meeting at 9 in the morning, and then we'll have one at... um, 1045, so appreciate you.